Hello and welcome back to the Napoleonic Wars pod, where today we're going to attempt to do things ever so slightly differently. It's still a podcast and it's still a cracking topic. Um, and what's not different is the focus on many other perspectives on topics that you might think you know very well. So we're going to look at Salamanca, but crucially, we're going to look at it from the French perspective. I am joined by Gary Wills, who is incredibly modest. I'm going to open by saying that. I mean, he doesn't describe himself as a historian, but has written several books, uh, including Wellington's First Battle, which is on Boxall in 1794, The Men Behind the Memorial, which is a World War One book. It's the wrong war. We don't need to worry ourselves with that. Um, but, you know, if you've got a World War One interest, go and have a read. Wellington at Bay, Villa Muriel, 1812. And his latest book, Throwing Thunderbolts, War of the First Coalition, 1792 to 7, which has been the focus of a kind of protracted Twitter kind of stream thread thing, technical term there, um, where every day Gary has been posting about different battles that take place. And it's fantastic. If you like this kind of on this day in history stuff, you're going to love it. So people go follow Gary on Twitter. Details are going to be in the uh, descriptor to this episode. But uh, you'll also find him by just searching Case Shop Publishing, which is the account that he um, posts under. He's also, though, written a few chapters um, in, and done a whole kind of bunch of research on battles like Boxtel, Lincel and Toulon. But m quite recently, he did something on McCune at the Battle of Salamanca. So he and I put our heads together and decided that it would be nice having we'd be having done Salamanca quite to death on this show from the British perspective to do Salamanca from the French perspective, which is how we're going to do it today. Now, what's different about that? Well, Gary has a series of maps to help us through this. So feel free to continue listening on YouTube. But if you want the images that are going to kind of be key to the discussions that we're going to have over the course of the next however long, you need to head over to YouTube, search for the Napoleonic Wars channel, and you will then be able to see the video version of this show. So that is a shameless plug of sorts, but it's one that allows you to get the full experience of this episode. And whilst you're there, why not whack the like button and subscribe? That was a shameless plug. Um, Gary, sorry about the overly long introduction there. Great to see you. Welcome. This is your first time on the show, I believe. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. It's uh, yeah, it's my first time, and it's a great honour uh, to get the chance to talk about this uh, work, uh, which uh, came out of uh, my annual Twitter uh, rant about uh, uh, the forty thousand men in forty minutes uh, statement. Yes, that very infamous quote um, that. Uh, tell you what we'll get to that we'll get to that. <laughs> that, that that deserves like a whole sort of question in its own right um let's start because a, a lot of what you're what you've done on this is about McCune right yeah uh, inevitably we talk a lot about um Marmont for very obvious reasons um Ferry gets kind of a passing mention because he gets a horrible death gets cut in half by a cannonball um we'll also talk about Ferry's last stand as it were uh, i know you've got some really interesting comments on that but mccune one of the divisional commanders at salamanca where does he come from and what what had he done sort of pre-salamanca well i'm yeah, pre the revolution he uh he joined the the pioneer corps and uh he uh, worked his way up to lieutenant um but when the revolution came uh Typical of the man, I think, he enlisted as a grenadier in the first Paris, uh, Paris Volunteers. And uh, uh, within a couple of years, he was uh, a lieutenant in the 23rd Infantry Regiment. And he progressed through the ranks. And so by the time of the uh, Napoleon's campaigns in 1805 to 1807, he's in uh, Ney's Corps. And he was a general brigade uh, and fought at Friedland and um, uh, and also at Elsing and Jena and Eilau. So he had a lot of experience. When Ney went to Spain, 
McCune went with him again as a brigade commander and he got his promotion to general division in Spain when he was uh, given the 5th uh, Division of the Army of Portugal. He's, uh, I, he's, I, I rather like him, although I don't know him, uh, and there's a couple of things I like about him. One of his colonels uh, described him uh, as a... Uh, the sort of man who likes to uh, get up close to the enemy and not watch them from afar because being from afar multiplies the images you see. So he described him as standing, so this is a general division and also a corps commander, standing between his, his tirailleurs and his, his waiting columns uh, to see what was going on. So this is the sort of guy... The other thing I like about him is that uh, there are no, as I, that I could find, no portraits of him. And if anybody listening to this knows of a portrait of him, I'd be delighted to hear about it. But there aren't any portraits of him that I can find. And this is probably because he's the sort of guy who would rather uh, go to the Palais Royal and get thrown out of it while gambling uh, than sit in an artist's studio having his portrait painted. So he's that sort of guy. He believed uh, in a very aggressive style of warfare, which clearly got him into trouble on more than one occasion. And as I hope I will show, Salamanca is not one of those occasions. <laughs> yeah, uh, I often feel McCune sort of almost ends up being a footnote in the Salamanca story, but well, uh, not yeah. now. That's that's yeah. like the reason behind the chapter, right? But yeah. um yeah, we just sort of go, Thermia and McCune, some things happen, and then we move on. Um, and I think well, it's actually Tomia, isn't it? Uh, apologies to French listeners for the pronunciation there. But I think there's a, there's a lot of focus on Tomia, perhaps for obvious reasons, and McCune just sort of gets pushed to one side. Yeah, I've found the same issue, trying to find a portrait of the guy, not easy. No. Um which is is funny for somebody sort of that senior, but perhaps it's a reflection of the fact that he's out in Spain and, as yeah. you say, you know he's he's got better things to do with his time perhaps than sit and pose for a portrait. Um, in terms of his personal character, what's he like to actually get on with? Does he end up rubbing people up the wrong way like so many generals during this period, or is well, he... yeah, I mean, uh, one of the interesting things is his chief of staff. Um, uh, wasn't uh, a big fan of his um, and uh, felt he tra uh, treated his subordinates very brusquely. And uh, uh, so, yeah, he, he, wasn't, he, he wasn't popular in that regard. And obviously, uh, Marmont uh, didn't like him at all, <laughs> as we shall see. Do you want to talk about that now or do you want to uh, save that a little bit? Um, Just kind of that, that no, friction no, between the two. Yeah, I, that's, I think we should uh, probably uh, talk a bit more about how he fits into uh, the Salamanca story. Okay. Uh, and uh, so that we know what my baseline was uh, in doing this work. Um, and everybody will have read Oman and Fortescue's accounts of Salamanca. And uh, in those accounts, uh, it's a very simple story. Um the uh, Wellington, in a moment of brilliance, uh, sees Thomier's division parading down the Monte Design, decides there's a big enough gap for him to do something, and attacks that division. And then each of the French left-wing divisions are apparently destroyed in turn. Um, the 6th Division, uh, um, by, uh, led by Tolpin, and uh, obviously Malka, McCoon's division, uh, the 5th Division. And so all of these divisions are destroyed. And if you, um, if you read these accounts, the, uh, they're, they're said to be streaming towards uh, Albert de Tourum as never to be seen again. And uh, so Fortescue, uh, for example, describes them as uh, being destroyed for all military purposes. And, uh, and, and that is uh, um, the story that gets repeated time and time again. And, and it culminates in, as we said at the beginning, Napier citing the, French, the unknown French officer 
who described it as uh, the defeat of 40,000 men in 40 minutes. And um, I think uh, when you when you take it simply like that, it's sort of the Ladybug book, it's a fairly simple story. Um, and uh, as you mentioned earlier on, uh, Ferre uh, uh, got the dubious honour of defending the rear guard, and, but he did it alone because um, one of his guys said he did it alone. Uh, so that's the story, the base story that, that we start from. Um, and uh, I think the um, uh, it's a very convincing story. Uh, uh, on the screen at the moment is my favourite picture of uh, Salamanca, which I like to think is shows Lieutenant Balthazar of the 66th line uh, bravely defending his eagle against the British cavalry, uh, which we will come into more. Before I go on to say what I think actually happened, it is probably worth saying uh, what Professor Rory Muir said about McCune uh, in his conclusions. He said, McCune's movements are impossible to reconstruct precisely. And I wanted to make that point because what I'm going to present uh, during this discussion is a whole bunch of weak signals. Uh, because if there were strong signals, Professor, uh, Professor Muir would have seen them uh, and, uh, and, the, and we wouldn't necessarily need to have this discussion. But if you look at it from the French perspective, there are a whole th series of things that don't add up. And uh, perhaps I should go on to uh, talk about those uh, as, they, uh, as they occurred to me. I'm glad that you did bring in Rory on this. Um, somebody who uh, folks will know I, I have a great deal of respect for and a lot of love for his work. Um, his book, Salaman 1812, is, in my opinion, superb. Um, and I particularly love the fact that he is um, very frank about the challenges of this. And he not only kind of gives you that standard commentary on the battle, but then also kind of lays all of these sources alongside one another and goes, this is what they say, but they contradict one another and it's it's a mess. And in terms of understanding just how irritating actually history can be sometimes in trying to unpick all of these kind of little knots uh, and trying to work out what is the, the reality, um, it's a really good indication of actually what goes on behind the scenes in the mind of a historian. Um, so I thoroughly recommend that to people. In addition, of course, to Glory is Fleeting, where you will find the chapter uh, which covers uh, what we're talking about today. Um, straight away, though, I, I want to talk about something that's a bit odd in terms of um, the accepted version. And you, you alluded to it there, you know, that perception that you've got these two French divisions just sort of casually going for a stroll along the Monte de Zan go and stand on the Monte de Zan and then try to imagine an entire division marching along its top, you wouldn't do it. And there's a really good reason why you wouldn't do it. When you get to the end of the Monte de Zan, it's a really steep climb down. So the point has been made to me by um, a fan of the show, um, which in turn comes from Rob Pocock, the, the battlefield guide, that actually there's a possibility they were on both sides of the Monte de Zan, you know, kind of split with the Monte de Zan between them. I'm curious if you've kind of got any thoughts on that and whether you've found any evidence that might lead us to some conclusions one way or the other on, on that problem. Well, I think one of the interesting things is that in, um, in uh, Marmont's uh, memoirs, he, he talked about... Um, McCune actually advocating to him that they they attack Wellington, and uh, and Marmont dismissed him out of hand. And uh, and the other thing you have to ask yourself about the Monte design, if the, from where from where Marmont stood, there were two, he had two basic options that that day. He 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 could try and mount a a serious attack on Wellington and he could have sent his divisions around Wellington's flank intending to seriously uh, compromise uh, Wellington. Um, if he was going to do that, he wouldn't have sent Tomies along the top of the Monte de Zans where Wellington could see them. And, and the, the, so it's fairly clear, I think, from what he asked Tomies to do, that 
all he was expecting was that as soon as he he, he sent his uh, his uh, divisions along that uh, uh, hill hilltop, Wellington would see them and say, "Right, it's time to leave." And you know, so you know that turned out to be a massive miscalculation in in the context of how Tom Mears executed it. And uh, but yes, the the whole geography, you know, seems to have swallowed up uh, Curto's like cavalry uh, brigade as well in the whole thing of it. So you know, God knows uh, what what uh, he thought he was doing. It is a mystery that um, we can only scratch our heads at for the moment, yeah. sadly. Um, okay, so let's talk about how you began to notice problems with this version. Um, talk us through sort of the, you've alluded to this or, or, or a little bit already, but I just want to sort of unpick this a little bit further. How did you start to become aware of issues with it? Was it just the simplicity of it? You know, so Tommy Ayer's men get broken, McCune's men get broken, and then they all just run away, um, which doesn't sound really like the French army that we know of other campaigns. You know, this is a force that is consists of incredibly brave men um, who fight very well, in some cases have multiple battles and campaigns um, to, to their, their name. And the idea that they're just going to break and run like raw conscripts perhaps doesn't you know, sort of sit well with what you'd expect. Well, I I I came at it um, from a slightly different point of view. I, I after I published Wellington's first battle, I I, I was uh, demonstrated my war game of Boxtel to Carol Duval, and as she left, she said to me, "Oh, you should look at Villa Muriel," and uh, and I uh, initially. Thought well, that would be a nice article in the War Games magazine. Well, eight years later, Wellington at Bay was born, and uh, but as as I said, I, I am Prince. The reason I do this history is for a very trivial reason. I'm a I'm a war gamer. I like to recreate these things with toy soldiers, and uh, so when looking at uh, Villa Muriel. Coincidentally, it involved McCune's division and Leith's division, although Leith wasn't with them anymore. And uh, so what I needed to know, I needed to know what to paint up to put on the table, is McCune's eagles. I needed to know what his, his, um, his battalions carried. And uh, so I started to look at Salamanca because it's the obvious place to start. It's a you know for all of this sort of thing. And um, and I read in uh, Oman that Oman makes the point that uh, um, because two of Mukun's regiments, uh, their senior battalions were fourth battalions, he makes the point that they they couldn't have uh, carried eagles um, because. Following losses of eagles earlier in the empire, uh, Napoleon took them away from all, all but the first battalion, and uh, so Armand concluded that obviously Macuna would only have had two eagles at uh, at Salamanca. Well, he was wrong uh, because he overlooked the fact that, like all armies, the French army has a rule. Uh, but actually, to understand it, you have to know what the exceptions are. And in the case of McCune's division, um, the two uh, two of his regiments, the two that were led by their 4th battalions, the 66th and the 82nd, uh, were originally garrisoned in the West Indies, the 66th were in Guadeloupe and the 82nd on Martinique. And obviously... I think around 1809, um, the the British took those islands off the French, and those three battalions of each regiment, with their eagles, were captured and and prisoners of war and and so on. What the French did is they recreated the the um, uh, the, the 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 regiments, uh, but numbered them four, five, six. In fact, one of them was seventh battalion. Uh, in both cases. And they gave the fourth battalions uh, uh, an eagle. So this meant that um, 
McCune had four eagles at um, uh, at Salamanca. Yes, apparently destroyed by Leith from the front and the uh, heavy cavalry from the flank. He got away with all four of those eagles. So how did that happen? I asked myself. And uh, of course, Leith did capture an eagle, but it wasn't one of McCoon's. It was one of the seventh uh, divisions. And um, so this immediately uh, uh, begged uh, an obvious question. Um, the 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 second um, the second bit I needed to know was what guns did um, McCune have? What, uh, what was his divisional artillery like? So again, go back to Salamanca. Let's have a look at what was going on. Um, at Salamanca, there's a the returns for the French army show that while all of the divisions of the left wing lost artillery, lost their lost some of their divisional guns. McHugh never lost any. He um, he retained all of his guns. So he escaped from this disaster um, with all of his eagles and all of his guns. And uh, it it begs the question of, well, how did that happen? How did that happen? And uh, let's... Uh... The other thing that seemed odd to me was... Um, when you look at Oman's map of the uh, of the battle, you can see McCune here um, uh, to the southwest of um, of uh, the uh, the village, and um, yet Albert de Tormes is, is to the southeast. So what Oman is having us believe is that Leith attacked up that up the Montezan hit and destroyed McCune, and instead of them running away south, they ran away southeast. And that didn't ring true to me um, because we would uh, they would have missed Ferry's position and, and all of this. So that, that raised a significant doubt in my mind. So, folks, um, sorry, if you could just go back to the, the previous one. Um, this is the classic map from... Um, Sir Charles Oman's history of the Peninsula War. It's probably been the basis of, of many a, a reproduction, frankly, um, over time. And you can see um, top left, Ardea Tahada. That's where Pakenham's um, division start out. And then they end up uh, striking sort of Thomia, sorry, Tomia full in the face. Um, for more details on this, that I did a live stream on Salamanca. You can go back and, and watch that. Um, but this is the classic thing. And, and there is a, a marked gap between Tomia and McCune's division, which has often sort of left me with a little bit of a head scratch in, in itself, because McCune doesn't feel particularly isolated. When you're stood there, and this is always the value of walking the ground, when you're stood there, you look at where McCune is in relation to where the rest of the army is, and he doesn't feel anywhere near as isolated as Tommy Air would have been. Is that something that strikes you? Yeah, I mean, I think the um, uh, the, the distance that, that between Tommy Ayres and McCune is huge. And um, uh, clearly the, the, the big problem here is the, that Tommy Ayres was allowed to go that far. Uh, ahead, um, because had he kept closer to McCune, um, uh, and in fact, McCune definitely, I'm, I'm pretty sure McCune wasn't there. Um, but uh, if it had kept closer to the rest of the French divisions and and followed their normal deployment, uh, which again I'm going to come on to later, um, Wellington wouldn't have had an opportunity to exploit. And so uh, where he was when Wellington decided the needs of tax is another matter. I mean, uh, this, this I, I not studied Daumiers at all, so I can't comment on how that, uh, how, why he's shown there. But um, uh, it's certainly worth understanding a bit more detail. But yes, the, the whole point about the Leith's axis of attack is, I think, one of the the key uh, elements of this that's made me wonder were 
has has this been misunderstood? And in terms of that gap, there's often a lot of debate about who's at fault. Should Marmont have kept his divisional commanders on a tighter leash? Is this Tomier getting a little bit too overexcited and um, overextending and, and overplaying his hand? What's your read of of why this ends up um, becoming a, an issue? I mean, it's guesswork to a certain extent. I, but my belief now is that um, Marmont felt that all he had to do was appear to threaten Wellington's uh, flank and Wellington would retire because it happened loads of times before. And um, I suspect um, uh, that sense of... Uh, I don't know whether you call it complacency or not, has infected um, uh, Tomies. And he just thinks, that obviously, if all I'm doing is demonstrating that we'll go that way, the further I go, the better it is. Uh, and the interesting thing is, as uh, Marmont himself said in his memoirs, McCune actually said we should be attacking Wellington, pinning him in position, uh, and and then attack his, his flank. And Marmont didn't want to do that. Um, because this is easier to get Wellington to move, is easier. It worked so far. Um, so I suspect that, and as I say, if you were going to, if it was an, an offensive move, uh, you'd have Tommy as on the other side of the hill. So he couldn't be seen. Mm. Absolutely. Um, we alluded to this earlier. There, There is a little bit of um, friction, shall we say, between McCune and Marmont. Um, you've talked a couple of times now about how Marmont almost dismisses this idea of, look, let's pin Wellington, let's kind of, uh, let's go for it. Uh, that idea gets dismissed out of hand. And so there are two things that immediately come to mind in terms of questions. One is, why is the relationship fractious? And the second is, has Marmont kind of, I don't want to say sort of lulled himself into a false sense of security, but is is he sort of in the wrong mindset by this point in the sense that he's not willing to take the fight to Wellington, perhaps for reasons related to what's happened to the French army when they have attacked Wellington on ground of his own choosing. And as a result of that, He's missing opportunities. I yeah, I, I I mean it's difficult to difficult to say. I think one of the things I would urge people to be cautious of is putting too much weight on what Marmon said in his memoirs, because um, he uh, said different things at the time. So his anger at um, at Marcoon is a more is a later invention. Because he he felt he obviously needed somebody to blame, and uh, uh, and, and Thomas is dead, so that was no good blaming him. And uh, the uh, what you'll see later on is uh, he learned um, when when the when it became obvious that this was a big deal, um, this defeat was a big deal. Uh, that he changed his story about McCune, as I'll show very very uh, clearly in a minute. But I, I suspect he, he was he, he was naturally expecting Wellington to retire as soon as he showed he was going to outflank him. He just botched the outflanking manoeuvre and, uh, uh, and didn't get the divisions moving together. Uh, because one of the things that, um, uh, again, you don't see much about is the... Uh, what is the normal deployment of the French divisions? Were they lining up for this? And uh, uh, they 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 work from the senior, the lowest number division on the right. So it's very simple. Whereas the British system is more complicated. With the French, it's simple. The the senior division goes on the right, which is why Foy was over on the other flank, and the junior division is on the left. And so what it should have been is Tomier's. Uh, Brenier's uh, corps, which is uh, led by Taupin, and then McCune. So, uh, so what's what this is showing is um, and the 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 order of battle 
under uh, less mature than it should be. And uh, arguably, Tomier should not have marched off that far without Brenier next to him, or Taupin's uh, division next to him, mm -hmm. 6th Division. The, the other thing, if I can just go on, is the other thing that's interesting about McCune's division at Salamanca is a lot of their losses um, were actually focused on the 1st uh, Brigade, uh, uh, Darnay's Brigade, which would have been in the front line. And um, this is important for two reasons. Um, one is actually the second brigade, this is even after the end of the battle, the second brigade still, uh, uh, Montfort's brigade is still uh, okay. Um, while the, um, the, the, the losses of um, Donald's uh, fir uh, first brigade are like, uh, each of the regiments lost a third of the losses of the division. So two thirds of the losses of the division are in that first brigade and only one third in Montfort's brigade. And this has important um, uh, implications when you come to interpret what Marmont said about McCune. So Marmont said that McCune extended himself. Well, that's not what this shows. What this shows is that McCune deployed his division, as he should have done, as is required, which is the 1st Brigade's in the front line and the 2nd Brigade's behind them as their support. And uh, uh, there are other elements that, that show that. So all of this sort of added up to uh, this does not compute. Uh, let's have a look in more detail at what was going on. I'm just going to run through these numbers um, for the sake of those who are listening to this by the audio, the, you know, the radio show, as it were. Um, so what we've got here are casualties from McCune's 5th Division. Um, and if you break it down by units, so effectively the front line, the 1st Brigade, as Leith hits them, would have been the 15th lean and the 66th lean. In terms of casualties for the 15th lean, 17 officers, 590 men, that gives you a total of 607. For the 66th lean, 10 officers and 578 men, that gives you a grand total of 588, as I'm sure you can work out because I'm sure you can add 10 to most numbers in your life. The second brigade, however, is Montfort, so that's the 82nd lean and the 86th lean, and their casualty stats are much lower, which is the point that Gary's just been making. So 10 officers lost in the 82nd and 262 men it's a grand total 272 and then the 86th lean five officers and 265 men total 270 so you can really see the discrepancy there the 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 second brigade is losing frankly um fewer men than a single regiment in the first brigade so there's a massive disparity, which is a really good point. You know, it suggests that, yes, the, the first brigade took an absolute hammering, but the second brigade, not so. And if they haven't been routed, which is what these figures would suggest, this is not obviously the losses aren't insignificant, but they're not consistent with everybody's running away and the British heavy cavalry are sabring them as they run then it's a really good point the, that it doesn't add up, literally, in, in the case of, of figures. Particularly when you when you uh, see look at it in the view of Marmont's later accusation uh, that McCune extended himself, um, uh, which would imply he put the two brigades side by side and, and filled the gap. And, of course, the the uh, Sir Extended, which uh, Marmont actually wrote, has been interpreted in lots of ways, one of which is McCune marching down uh, the uh, Monte Tazan, uh, which doesn't, it's not really good uh, inter uh, translation of the French part from anything else. No, you're dead right. And and as I alluded to earlier, actually, you go stand on the Monte Tazan and you look at where he is and you go, no, no, he hasn't. Um, it's, it's absolutely not the case. So, okay. We've got lots of, um, lots of, um, uh, points here, but you've also flashed something else up on the screen. Talk me through this. Well, I mean, this is the, the summary point, which is, um, the, the McCune saved all four of his Eagles, all of his divisional guns. And this is not consistent with the accounts of him running away back to, 
um, uh, Albert de Tormes. And, and a particular interest here about the guns is his chief of staff's account, um, Girard. Um, essentially, I mean, uh, in the, the best book on Salamanca, uh, Professor Muir's book, uh, he gives um, uh, Girard's account, and, uh, uh, but actually doesn't give it a huge amount of credence. And, uh, but it depends what context you see it in. Now, Girard... He's, he's, he's a Frenchman writing his views, and some people get upset because at, uh, Sal at Villa Muriel, where he was injured in the shoulder, he recites the conversation he had with McCune uh, on that occasion, and people are saying, well, he couldn't have possibly remembered that. Well, he, as he had his shoulder hit, I suspect he might have done. And, that, you know, he's a bit he's excitable and all of this. And, and true enough, at the beginning of his account on, on Salamanca, he claims that he predicted the disaster, which is never a, never a good starting point for an uh, authoritative account. However, uh, what he goes on to say uh, is that... Um, he took particular attention of the, the, the divisional guns. He formed the divisional guns into a uh, uh, into a square with the caissons, uh, just like you see in the cowboy and Indian films. Uh, and he defended the guns against the onrushing uh, British cavalry. Now, when you read it per se, uh, without actually looking at the context, um, you, it, it sounds fanciful. This guy's just blowing his own trumpet. But the fact of the matter is, McCune's was the only division who got away with all of their all their artillery, and so I think his account, which I mean, dare I say it, us Anglo-Saxons tend to look at the French uh, excitable natures as something to be less credible. Um, I actually needs to be looked at again, I think, um, and uh, because it has big impacts. Uh, later on in the day, because he says, he claims, that at Albert de Tormes, uh, when night had fallen, McCune is on the bridge, and, uh, and the, no other senior officers around. He and McCune are on the bridge, garnering the last thousand men to hold the bridge against the uh, uh, Allied pursuit. Now, again, the, the key thing to remember is how late that is. When Oman has uh, uh, McCune's division being been, it's, it's about five o'clock in the afternoon. Darkness at uh, that time of day then is 11 o'clock at night. So it's six hours later. And the whole timeline um, uh, also uh, um, needs thinking about when you're thinking about uh, some of these things. Everybody talks about the ferry's rear guard, for instance, taking place as dark darkness fell, you don't see many people say, well, when was that then? Well, actually, it was 10, 11 o'clock at night. So what was happening in the five hours before? And uh, and that five hours was enough time for McCune to rally his division and uh, uh, and use it uh, later on in the, in the day. Um, that is a really good point, and I've been very guilty of that. I've never thought about exactly the timings. Um, I think in my head, I'd kind of assumed it must have been somewhere between about nine and ten. Yeah. At last stand, and you know, you you yeah. looked into it. I haven't looked at the the time of nightfall there in that part of the world on that particular yeah. date. Um, that's a really interesting you, point. You have to, you know, by the if you believe the uh, conventional stories, by half past seven at night, McCune's division would have been across the bridge at uh, Albert de Tormes and gone. Uh, yet there he is, last thing at night, 11 o'clock at night, standing on the bridge. And, yeah, you can say Girard is is uh, making it up, but why would he? He didn't mm -hmm. think McCune was a Marshal Ney. Uh, he didn't think he was a great man, but he's placed him there. And uh, so but that's, that's a long, long way ahead of where we need to start, which is, so what did... Um, uh, Marmot actually wants McCune to do. Okay, though. Well, yeah. Let's start there. Let's start there. So, if you if you go back to um, Oman's map again, and and what I've highlighted here is the uh, the village, uh, Rappelais village, 
uh, the uh, the position to the you know, I've said to the southwest. It's actually west southwest of the village, the where McCune is supposed to be, and I've I've highlighted the Greater Arapel. Um, there's a piece of land in between which uh, Oman's got nobody in, and um, uh, you have to ask yourself what goes on there, and. This shows the modern topography uh, of uh, of Oman's map, if you like. So I've I've placed McCune's um, and Leith's divisions on it, little boxes, the actual sizes that they would have deployment sizes that the uh, battalions would have occupied. And uh, as I said earlier on, if if uh, Leith uh, attacked south, you'd have expected. The, the the fifth division of the army of Portugal to retreat south. One of the things I want you to notice is um, between uh, McCune's supposed position and uh, the Greater Arapel, there are actually a series of low-level ridge lines that run down to the village. And uh, on the extreme end of one is the position that the 122nd uh, linear occupied. And uh, I think when you look at what Marmon said, and I'll read this out, uh, on the 25th of July, Marmon wrote to the King of Spain, uh, and this is his first statement of what went on. I caused it, the table land, to be occupied by the 5th Division and the Reserve of Horse Artillery with strict orders to confine themselves to the taking of the table land. Uh, McCune broke and drove off the English detachment who occupied the heights. I thought it necessary to bring up Frex troops to act with vigour in support of General McCune. And I've underlined this so that General McCune, notwithstanding the brilliant success which he had obtained, was forced by superior numbers to retire. So this is what he said about McCune straight after the battle. Um, and that, of course does not match what anybody thinks McCune did uh, on that day. And it certainly doesn't match what, uh, what Marmont later wrote. I, I'm still, sorry, if we can just go back to that. I'm still fixated on General McCune broke and drove off the English detachment, which occupied the Heights. Yeah. Well, that doesn't get folk featured in any story. What's he referring to? Though? Good question. Good question. Good question. It, the, it's um I mean there were the there was the race for the Greater Arapel, but mm. the, the French got there first. Exactly. Um, so they, they had think, occupied those. I think what he's talking about is the piece of land that I highlight in the map, which is uh not the Montezan, it's the uh the piece of land immediately adjacent to it. You have to question also. Well, that doesn't work either because you've got the fourth, the British Fourth Division attack, which obviously gets broken, doesn't get broken by McCune's men, but that's not the point. You know, to what extent has something got conflated in Marmont's mind? The guy has just been injured. You know, you have to kind of consider every eventuality, but that's not consistent either because the British hadn't occupied any heights for that to be the case. So that's. That's a bit baffling, all things well, considered. Well, the particularly baffling thing is that so that General McHugh, notwithstanding the brilliant success which he had obtained, so McHugh, Marmont left that battle not thinking that McHugh had done anything wrong. No. If anything, McHugh's the hero of the hour. On that occasion, yeah. Mm. Okie dog. And on, by the um, six days later, Marmont wrote to the Minister of War, and the position has started to uh, um, uh, shift slightly. I gave orders uh, to the 5th Division to take position on the extreme right of this plateau, the fire from which was perfectly connected with that from Arapalais. The 5th Division, after taking the indicated post, extended to the left without any motive nor reason. And here you start to get the Extended. Well, again, so extend it is is not move. It, it means deploy um, and uh, deploy the two brigades. 
or, or deploy skirmishers. And so we started to move. Um, and then we, the other thing we have about um, uh, McCune is uh, Napier in 1836 um, says that McCune maintained a noble battle during the withdrawal, which is interesting for a couple of reasons. Now, it, he, he clearly, from the account, gets confused with Bonnet and, and Ferry's divisions at different times, perhaps. But the thing that's interesting about this is that this is at the same time as some of the French accounts uh, of the battle were being published. And around that time, they were all blaming Thomiers. McCune never got a mention as being the author of the defeat at, at, um, uh, at Salamanca. And so, you know, at around 1830, nobody's dressing McCune up as the, as the idiot. Um, but I want to come back to this point that Marmont made. I gave orders to the 5th Division to take a position on the extreme right of the plateau. And uh, remember that for later. And this is what is in the memoirs, uh, which is a lot of text. So I won't read it all out. Um, And McCune uh, made this point that I referred to earlier, that, we sh that they should be attacking uh, the, the uh, British. And, uh, and Marmont's then telling him he's, he's got to keep calm. McCune, a man of little capacity, though a very brave soldier, could not contain himself when he's in the presence of the enemy. And he then talks about an incident in the, on the passage of Juro some days before, uh, which he claimed compromised the army. It didn't. Uh, it didn't even get mentioned in Oman. Uh, he, he, all that McCune did is he, he went half a mile further down the road than he should have done. Um, uh, but there was no threat. The British had left a long time before. So you can see here, having left, had little regard for his obedience, I determined to go there myself and having taken a last look at the top of the road, you get the story of him uh, being wounded uh, by the uh, cannon fire. So he's, he's making the point that he needed, by this time, so this is uh, 1850s, that he, he felt he needed to, to uh, go and uh, keep control of McCune. And there's always been one significant thing that I've never entirely bought about this, which is, you know, oh, I need to ride off and deal with this myself. Um. Does he though? Because he's uh, th for me. This is something that you can. He's got aides. He can send a rider off and say, "I need you to do this instead." He doesn't necessarily need to be on the ground at this point. So I've always kind of regarded this. Oh, uh, well, I was about to mount my horse and ride off and solve and save the entire day thing as something that you can talk about with the benefit of hindsight because he knows that after that point, everything really goes badly wrong. So I've always bought, considered that as saving face, but others, of course, disagree. But what's your read of it? Well, I think the, the interesting thing is that he doesn't say here, I was getting on my horse going right after Tommy is. Um, and because uh, that's where he should have gone. Mm -hmm. um, or that, and they probably did send an aide. I don't know. Um, the point is, he uh, if... If uh, it's right that McCune was on the um, on the, the end of the plateau, he and, and was advancing towards uh, the Arapalais village, then he, that's only a short ride down. I mean, it's right next door. French leaders were, you know, you know, Wellington had a lot in common with them in some regards. Um, he tends to be compared to, to Napoleon, but most French leaders. Would have got on their horse and rode to the 150 yards, 200 yards down to say, "Hang on, you need to be doing this." The French leaders, by and large, are lead from the front type of guys. So I don't disbelieve that. Mm -hmm. The question I would ask is, why don't you go and chase after Tomies uh, an hour before? That is a, a very... And the answer is because Tomies was doing what he wanted him to do. Yeah, it's a really good and really interesting point. Um, so we were just talking about the whole Marmont's about to ride off and inverted commas save the day and is sort of laying the blame very squarely at McCune's feet, certainly in his memoir. 
written a long time after the event, we should say. Um, I'm skeptical about some of that, but you know, you've made the the important point that actually, perhaps Marmont is is somebody who uh, and French commanders generally are the sorts of people who would actually just kind of get their backsides over there and say, "Look, this is exactly what I want you to do." Uh, more kind of Wellingtonian in style, Wellingtonian in style there. Um, but of course, that's not what happens um, for for Marmont. Uh, he gets wounded. So, what does McCune actually physically do during all of this? You know, let's let's just park all of the the supposition and, and all of the misconceptions and the conflicting evidence. What do we know about what the heck McCune's division actually end up doing when they well, have to face Leith? What we know is that. McCune sent his his um uh his, so I'll, I'll step back. McCune organized his division into two brigades, one behind the other. He sent his skirmishers forward uh towards Arapalais village, um which uh to a certain extent, uh, which is is known because we know what the British uh, uh said. Um and uh so it, to a certain extent. Uh, contradicts Marmont's uh, memoirs, which implies that uh, McCune had sent the whole division down towards uh, um, uh, uh, towards the village. Um, what what is is up for grabs is exactly where that conflict between Leith and McCune took place. As we said in the first episode. Uh, Oman has it taking place to the south west of um, uh, the, uh, the the village of Arapalais. The I think there's a very strong case that he was actually to the south east of the village. And um, if we go back to and we remember what um, Marmont said that he wanted McCune on the extreme right end of the uh, tablelands. And uh, and so here I positioned him in a different position. Uh, it, I think McCune's role in this was to be the hinge, uh, part of the hinge on which uh, Tom Yez and Tarpan's divisions deployed behind him. And so he approached uh, not on the, from the north, north-south axis, but I believe on the uh, uh, on the southeast to northeast. This has a number of advantages to think about it. One is that there are these ridge lines, and if you look at them using the Spanish geographic um, uh, mapping systems, you can see these ridge lines quite clearly, and it allows you to position uh, McCune's division consistent with some of the descriptions that we've got. So we know the artillery was further back than the infantry, um, which, by the way, if it was where Oman uh, said it was, the artillery would have been the other side of the hill. Um, and it gives us uh, positions on which uh, McCune's volunteers could advance towards. Um, the So that works. The, the other thing that works really well with this is that... Um, uh, later in the day, uh, Leith's, after Leith has attacked uh, and beaten McCune, uh, Spry's Portuguese division is sucked off by uh, to the to the left by uh, Beresford to help out uh, repelling the French counterattack. Now, if McCune was where Oman had him, they would have been, you know, a good part of a mile away when they did that that. That March, Spry's after action report said his men virtually had to just turn left and march off. They, they had no distance to cover. So I think there's a very strong case built up of lots of weak signals that McCune was positioned here on this intermediate uh, piece of land, which I highlighted on Oman's map in the last episode, not on the Monte de Zan as Oman would have it. And it makes a, a lot of sense in a number of ways. If we, uh, if we look at uh, the rest of the divisions and uh, are around um, uh, McEwen at this time, uh, you have Tommy Ayres' division 
being hurried towards him, uh, towards his open flank, and you have uh, Talpan and Clausel behind him. And I think the um, uh, you can understand here where um, uh, that where how the cavalry attack on uh, McCune would have played out. Interestingly, the, um, uh, the the other piece of evidence which I think goes this way is if you compare the accounts of Wallace's brigade with Leaf's division, they don't mix. They they contact one another. But they don't mix. If Leith had been attacking south across the Monte Dizan, pushing McCune out of the way, he would have run big time into uh, into Wallace's brigade, and they didn't. And um, so, for me, it's 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 a fairly strong case. I think when you think about did McCune do go too close? to um, uh, the Arapalese village. Well, yeah, if it had stood a bit further back, um, he wouldn't have been as vulnerable to the attack by Leith and the cavalry as uh, standing where I, I've put him here. Um, uh, but you, you, um, you, you've got a much more coherent battle line. And as I say, the other thing that, that makes sense with this is that Talpan's leading the 6th Division, whose job was to fill the gap between the 7th Division and the 5th Division. So it's quite sensible that McCune would stay where he was. And uh, it would be he was embarrassed by the British cavalry because Talpan hadn't got to secure his, his left flank. You, you've always got to think about these guys as thinking people. Don't just assume that they're dumb and... They've got to the, the these places where they have in life by chance. And if you're McCune and you're standing there facing north as Leith comes at you, you would know that your left flank would be absolutely wide open because you know that Tommy is somewhere over there, but you can't see him. There's no there's no form of contact between the two because he's all the way at the other end of the Monte de Zan. And we know he's at the other end of the Monte de Zan because we know from the British accounts of where they make contact with Tommy Ayres' men. So what that therefore means is that we're having to believe that McCune is happy to just leave that left flank waving in the air whilst Topan comes along and fills it whenever he deigns to. And instead, with what Gary's put on this map, actually by no means is his left flank secure, but it's not quite as cruelly exposed as it might otherwise have been. Because as Gary said, you know, in this version, you have McCune facing, uh, what would this be? Northwest, um, which has a, a deal of sense to it. I think the, the, um, the other thing about this positioning is it, it, one of the questions I posed at the beginning is, how did McCune get away from uh, what was a very serious attack? He was attacked uh, by Leith from the front, uh, a very serious attack. Darno, the brigade commander of the first, uh, uh, first brigade, was, was wounded and, in fact, captured. Um, I think three of the four battalion uh, leaders were wounded or killed. Uh, one of the battalions was being led by a captain uh, in that first brigade. It was a massive attack, um, and so the question is, how did they, how did they, um, how did they survive? And I think when you look at it in this position, as uh, McCune's division breaks under the combined assault of um, uh, Leith and Le Marchand, what happens is they run into. Uh, the divisions behind them, uh, Talpan and Clausel. So there's thousands and thousands of soldiers there. There, there aren't that many British cavalry. So even though it was a very effective charge, um, there's still the opportunity for uh, certainly Monfort's brigade to get away uh, without too much, uh, too many casualties. And yeah, Darnold's. Uh, uh, Brigade was very badly affected, as we said earlier on. Um, 
But you can see how they could have escaped if they're in this position at the end of the uh, uh, of the tableland before Monte Design, rather than a mile down the road uh, towards Tomiers. This is really interesting. Um... And, and this this just makes the point that um, you know the sixth division should be between the fifth and seventh when it hadn't got there when this all happened. No, it really hadn't, had it? No. Do we know why Topin is so... Uh, I was going to be mean and say slow, which uh, is is uh, perhaps unnecessarily unkind of me, but, I mean, Topin's not where he should be by any measure. Do we know why? I should imagine the fault is more with Tommy Ayers. You know, the, the ground is 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 fairly broken that they've come over. I should imagine the thing that makes it look odd is Tommy Ayers so far advanced, so far ahead of the rest of the divisions. Uh, and you could argue that, you know, McCune is just, a, you know, a few hundred yards too close to the uh, rapid. With hindsight, he might have stopped at the ridge before, Rather, the ridge he's put his artillery on rather than the one I've got him stopped at. Um, I don't think he was further down because the British are fairly clear that it was only um, his Voltigeurs that were on the forward slopes. They they say that that Darn uh, McCune's men, Darnold's men, were still on the on the high ground, uh, which is why I've put them where I have. <laughs> okay, so at this point, shall we? Uh, I'm I'm still digesting this. Um, it's a really interesting concept. Um, I need to get back out there and have another look at the land and see this for myself. Because inevitably, you go there with the received opinion in your your mind, and so you look at it and try and sort of work it out that way. But you're in the process. Actually, you end up not reading other aspects of the landscape and. Yes, uh, particularly because I mean I've stood on the top of the uh, Greater Arapel and you know and looked across, took photographs uh, and all of that. But actually, the thing to remember is a guy's only only uh, uh, six uh, five foot five inches high at this time, so you don't have to have a great ridge uh, for it, to, you know, for it to be a position. So these little ridgelets um, are equally useful uh, positions. Uh, for him to line up on, and and uh, more importantly, are consistent with the with the um, the accounts that the British uh, have left us. And there's also a point to be made that none of no feature on the battlefield of Waterloo is anywhere near as significant as the majority of the features that you see on the Salamanca battlefield, you know, in terms of how deep the valleys are and, and how high the ridges are. No, they're not Himalayan. Of course they're not, but they are still higher and more significant than what you see today at Mont Saint-Jean. And even if you allow for, okay, the heights have dropped because of farming and erosion and all the rest of it. So has also that's also been the case at, at Salamanca. Um, so you can't, um, you can't win the argument that way. This is, this is really interesting. Should we move on to talk about ferry? Yes, at this point. So, um, so, so my uh, my contention is that yeah, uh, there's no question that Leith and Le Marchand uh, defeated and broke McCune's division. The, even the French accounts say that. Uh, I think they were protected because they ran through the other supporting divisions, and that's why they didn't get more more extra more beaten up. But the point I made earlier there then comes into play. This happened at five o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, the rear guard uh, took place uh, five hours later, and that gave time uh, and uh, for Clausel, who was the eventual commander of the army, to rally the remainder of the left wing. Uh, of the French army. And the early French accounts in the 1830s all make this point that uh, Clausel collected together uh, uh, units from the left wing 
on the uh, on the position that Ferry eventually defended. Uh, so I, I know I'm, you know, forgive me, I, I I've not studied the the French counterattacks and all of that, but uh, so I'm jumping ahead in the battle. Yeah. So let me just kind of add a little tiny bit of context for folks who haven't listened to other episodes on Salamanca. So what effectively happens, folks, is um, Wellington's attack goes in a, a series of phases and it's meant to sort of almost ripple across the French position. Third Division uh, effectively ends up taking on Tomier. Fifth Division Leiths ends up taking on uh, McCune's. So Fifth Division versus Fifth Division in this case. Um, and then the fourth division, which is the weakest division of Wellington's forces, ends up trying to break. Um, oh Lord, is it Clausel or Bonnet's division? Um, oh, that's a that's a faux pas on my part. Uh, we'll leave this in the final edit. Um, <laughs> you got any thoughts, Gary? Is it Clausel or is it? Because they, they both, both end up. They both ended up getting uh, a really hard time. Yeah, didn't they? Um, so, yes, w- one way or another. Oh, that's going to bug me all day. Um, I think it's Clausel. I think it's Clausel's division ends up being attacked by 4th Division, fends them off, um, and then follows up. And it doesn't um, go well because Wellington has the reserves there in the form of 6th Division. He just sends them forward. They then break the French counterattack. Um, and then with um, effectively French left and French centre having been beaten, um, there's there's not a vast amount left for the French to do other than to start trying to salvage things from the situation. And so the Greater Arapal is abandoned by the 120th Lean, which is in Bonnet's division, um, and they um, they pull back effectively. This and and so we get to. The final stand um over to you i guess gary yeah just just before we move on to ferry i i skipped over this slide earlier on so i, I really need to bring it back this, this is the pinned tweet on my uh on my uh twitter and professor muir uh, kindly wrote just finished reading gary wills's uh account of McCoon's division at the Battle of Salamanca in Glorious Fleeting, full of interesting new information and a very plausible argument about the access of Leith's attack, southwest rather than south. So uh, can't say any more than that. And this is why I have so much love for Rory, because he is always open to fresh ideas. And, uh, you know, some of your work is inevitably going to fly in the face of some of his work. Does he turn around and go, oh, no, that can't possibly be the case. You know, I've written a book on Salamanca and I'm Rory Muir. Couldn't be less like the guy to come out with something like that. Wouldn't even occur to him. Here's some decent evidence. Here's a plausible argument and goes, this is really interesting. People go read it and judge for yourself. Um, And he gave me some stuff uh, for the bit on Ferry that I'm about to talk to. Um, So the 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 classic account of of ferry's uh, defense is that um his division was left all alone everybody else had run off uh and we have this from a french uh eyewitness um and the the, the classical description and I'll show it in this map the ferry deployed his battalions in line in a single line the ones on the end were in square which shortens their line and um, and that's that's great description. Um, the guy who described it was only a captain at the time, so easy for him not to know what else was going on on the battlefield was my contention. The thing that's really interesting is when you put that up against what the British did. So they sent uh, Clinton's division um, uh, to attack Ferry, but on his left he had Cole's division, and Leith's division, now commanded by Pringle, was on his right. Now, when you when you work out what frontages those divisions would have had, um, even allowing for um, uh, casualties, uh, there's no way Ferry could have held them off. Not for the length of time that is said uh, in the accounts on his own, because this was a ferocious battle. But also, uh, it, it, you wouldn't need to. Wellington wouldn't allow it. Why? Why would you send in what? What we're looking at here, basically three divisions. 
mm. to to deal with one French division. This is the army that has literally just shattered multiple French divisions one on one. You wouldn't need to. There's there's nothing unique about Ferre's division. They're not suddenly made up of superhuman individuals. You'd send so, one division to do the job. It doesn't make sense. It always has struck me as overkill. Yeah. So the the only makes sense if the French had other units there. And uh, I think there's at least a case that part of McCune's division was there. And uh, I'll come back to that when we talk about flags, because uh, the, the, the 11th foot captured uh, a green flag uh, during this part of the action. And uh, uh, that in itself is interesting. Um, not many people have asked the question as to what that green flag was. And and that's one of the things I want to come on to. So my my uh, my argument is that other regiments, uh, according to the early French accounts, were on that ridge defending against those three British divisions, holding the line for the rest of the army to get away. And I think McCune's uh, um, battalions are at least as likely as any others to be part of that, particularly. Um, the, uh, uh, the the second brigade, but I also think some of the first brigade. Let me talk about timings with you here. So we've had the the fourth British fourth division, Allied fourth division. Apologies um, to Portuguese and Spanish listeners, not to um, disparage against the contribution of of uh, particularly Portuguese troops during this battle. So the Allied fourth division breaks. Is that the Allies then have to face a counterattack in the center? Sixth Division plugs the gap, breaks the counterattack. What time have we got to once the Great Arab Power has been abandoned? This this final stand of Ferry plus, as you know, as we're discussing, it seems increasingly plausible yeah. plus others. Um, what kind of time have we got to in terms of making all of that happen? Because the distances aren't vast. But it still takes time to stop yeah. your men. You've got to reorganize, make sure that the um, the holes are plugged in in your individual battalions, lines, and all the rest of it close up and all of that. Where both, have we got to? Both accounts on uh, on both sorry accounts on both sides talk about this happening in uh, ending in darkness, and the French were allowed to slip away because it had already got dark. Hmm. Now, when you look at you know the uh, when that is you're talking after 10 o'clock 11 o'clock at night uh so the the fighting will have taken place in dusk and uh you know it's a good five hours after McCune uh, and the forty thousand men have been defeated in 40 minutes so that gives loads of time for McCune, um uh particularly uh to uh bring his division back into order if it's got away it does um and it also because there's another point here about wellington and the british why would they wait this long to attack a solitary french division making a stand to try and cover a rear guard yes you've got to allow the time to reorganize but it doesn't take five hours to get from even if you're walking it, folks, rather than driving it, it doesn't take five hours to march from the the village of Los Arapiles, or however you pronounce it, apologies, Spanish listeners, to the position of, of Ferry's last stand. Um, two, maybe. Sure, these guys are under fire and all the rest of it, but um, even two well, the, being generous. Well, the calculation I did had, uh, if McCune had run all the way and his guys had, in fact, if they'd marched, so if they'd marched all the way at a regulation marching speed, they would have been at Alba de Tormes at half past seven in the evening. Okay. Well, that, that in itself <laughs> says a lot, right? Because the... It's still going on at, uh, after dark. Exactly. And the British aren't just going to sort of stand around. And I know people love a cliche about us Brits, but we don't just sort of sit down and have a cup of tea as soon as the fighting peters out. If there wasn't a something stops the British from pressing on. That can only be not only a large body of troops, but a large body of well formed troops, because broken troops would be harried by either infantry or the light cavalry um that you know there's an opportunity here 
So this is, uh, uh, granted, it's circumstantial evidence, but logic indicates that this wasn't a cakewalk once um, Third and, and Fifth Division had had broken Tomier and McCune. Yeah, whatever you, whatever happens, and and you know, I said at the beginning, this is all weak signals. Uh, the one thing you can be pretty sure of is Ferry would not have lasted five minutes on that ridge alone with Leith turning it, you know, as, with Pringles, uh, now Pringles division, uh, outflanking him on that side because Pringles closer to Albert de Tormes than he is. So, um, you know, something more went on there. And, the you know, to be fair, the French accounts in the 1830s are all clear that Clausel rallied the divisions of the French left to help the, the rearguard action. And um, uh, and it, it goes on to uh, the point I made earlier on, is that Girard has McCune on the bridge at Albert Saunders uh, after dark, the last senior general there, because obviously Ferry's dead. And, uh, you know, you, you can disbelieve that if you like, but I tend to believe it. So interesting what happens when you look again hard at the sources. Okay, you mentioned flags earlier. Let's let's bring the, the business of this green flag in. What does the green flag signify? Well, I'll, I'll come to that. Let, oh, there's more. Let's, let's talk about the eagles. Okay, uh, this is a, a knotty little problem. Um, the, yeah, the, So in Wellington's dispatch, he talks about um, two eagles and six colours being taken. Now, this uh, picture I'm showing is in the Royal Collection, and uh, I couldn't afford to publish it in my book, so I didn't, <laughs> in my chapter, so I didn't. So, uh, uh, But what it clearly shows is the eagle of the 22nd and the, an, another eagle, which doesn't have a number on the caisson, which causes confusion later. Um it also shows, and uh, perhaps I'll, yeah, I've tried to pick these out. The other thing it shows are the banderoles of the of the two regiments, the twenty second linear on the left, one's red and one's white, and of the sixty second linear on the right, one's um, red and one's white, and we therefore can identify the eagle uh, as being the eagle of the 62nd because it says so on the banderole. And uh, we know from um, letters in Pringle's uh, um, archives uh, in Manchester, uh, which I think have just been published by Gareth, uh, that uh, it was the combined light companies of um uh, of Leith's brigade, uh, Leith's division that captured the eagle of the 62nd, and they specifically mention the 62nd. So uh, we'll come back to those in a minute. But the other thing they show is uh, in the, behind them at the back on the on the right is a fanion of an un, unknown uh, uh, regiment or battalion, rather. So just and, explain to folks what a fanion is. Right. So Oman does actually talk about this, uh, but it's more controversial than he thought. Uh, when Napoleon uh, took the eagles off of the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th and 6th division, uh, battalions, what he wanted was them to, be, to carry a plain um, uh, flag with no decoration. And uh, this, there was a hiatus for some time while they decided what the design should be. But in the early part of 2000, as 1812, a decree was published which said what they should carry, which were these completely plain flags um, with, on, with spear points, just as you see in this drawing. Um, and the second battalions would carry a white one and the fifth battalions would carry a green one. And it was important that these uh, flags had nothing on them because they were supposed to be of limited value. And, um, and the thing that's interesting about this drawing is it was drawn in August 1812. So after the, the, uh, 
the prizes, the trophies were took back to London. This was drawn and published. And so it, it, it puts, a, you know, an end to these stories about three eagles being captured at, uh, at Salamanca and all of that. Yeah, it does get bandied around, doesn't it? The suggestion yeah. that one of them just gets ripped apart because they think it's gold. Well, yeah. 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 Well, the other thing that, uh, you know, uh, belies that is in the French records. So here's a nice. Can we just stay with that a second? Um, the, um, the, the, you, you just said that the other thing that belies that is, is the French records. Just, just expand on that. I, I will in a minute. In a few okay. minutes. I, I just wanted to illustrate how these banderoles were used. Okay. So this is from the Funken's uh, uniform book. Obviously, the guy in the middle is carrying an eagle with the 18, 12 to 15 flag on rather than the one we're interested in. But you can see that the, the second and third eagle bearers are th carrying the banderoles to defend the, um, the eagle. That's their job. And you can. This shows the uh, the taking of the the sixty second um, uh, eagle by uh, the light companies of uh, Leith's uh, division. Uh, neither of these. I mean, Krista's got done an excellent rendition, but neither of them shows the the second and third eagle bearers uh, that were present. And uh, the importance of this is that. Um, that if you read Pringle's correspondence, the guys who actually took the flags uh, um, were from the three different regiments that made up the uh, um, uh, the light company battalion that was put together from Leith's uh, um, uh, first brigade, and Pratt is one of those uh, uh, those. Uh, people and what is apparently what appears to have happened is that they they took the eagle party intact one regiment went off with the eagle another regiment went off with one of the band roles and pratt went off with the, the other band role now pratt's role subsequently got blown up into taking another eagle um and uh, the eagle of the 22nd but he didn't. Uh, it's that's uh, a clear myth. What happened was this whole Eagle Guard was taken prisoner, and it and as should have happened because the Eagle Guards, the second and third Eagle Guards, are there to defend the Eagle. Uh, they're not going to run off and and leave the uh, the Eagle Bearer on his own. So yes, they were all they would get uh, both sets of these would get captured. And I, you were asking about records. If if you after the battle, they they, they there are records recording in, things like where the eagles uh, were. There's a specific column uh, that says eagles lost to the enemy. And uh, this one shows the uh, uh, the page that has the 66th line and the 101st line. And there appears to have been a clerical error because it says that the 62nd didn't lose an eagle, but the 101st did. Well, we know it was the other way around. Um, Shari, who is the great expert on French flags, uh, actually talks about a guy called Daltpole seeing these trophies in London. And he claimed he saw the eagle of the 101st that had been captured at Salamanca. Well, we saw from the, the diagram I've just shown you, the eagles didn't have their flags on them. So you couldn't tell which regiment it was other than from the caissons on the, uh, uh, on the eagles themselves. And the, the caisson of the 62nd didn't have a number on it. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't possibly have seen anything that he, he assumed it was the eagle of the 101st, presumably because of this clerical error, but it wasn't. It was the eagle of the 62nd, as evidenced by... Um, uh, the reports in Pringle's correspondence. So that leaves us with the eagle of the second, uh, the the twenty uh, second, um, which is up in Lancashire, uh, while the sixty second is in is in Chelmsford, and the eagle of the second twenty second is in Lancashire because Pratt was assumed to have taken it. 
And this is from a blog post I did, which I called The History of a Salamanca Myth. We all like a good myth, don't we? Oh, we have uh, myths busting on this show. Yeah. And uh, this is a, a citation. I What I did was I went back through all of the records, trying to find out when this story about Pratt taking the Eagle of the 22nd came about. And the interesting thing is that Pratt never claims it. Uh, it's not in the history of the uh, of his regiment, the 30th, uh, in neither of the histories of the of regiment, the 30th, do they claim that he uh, he uh, he took this eagle. And what what happened was in 1912, a guy called Fraser wrote the war drama of the eagles. And in it, it said the eagle of the 22nd was captured by a British officer of the 30th, Ensign Pratt, attached for duty to Major Crookshanks. 7th Portuguese, a light infantry Casadori battalion serving with the 3rd Division. That's what he said. And this is where the Ensign Pratt story starts. And it's why, why in 1947, when the Eagles were distributed uh, to the regiments, they went, it went to the 30th. But actually, none of it is true. Um, we know from Crookshank's own statement of service uh, that it wasn't Ensign Pratt, it was, uh, you think you've got troubles with pronunciation, Capital Geronimo Pereira de Vasconcelos uh, of the 12th uh, Casadores. And Pratt was never attached to the Portuguese. So, as I say, the, you know, there's a lot of talk at the moment about repatriating museum um, uh, artifacts. Uh, the uh, the eagle of the twenty second should be on that list. It should be in Lisbon. There is a thought for <laughs> there'll be some arguments about that, uh, I'm <laughs> sure. But yeah, okay. I, I, I think uh, the, the interesting thing is if you go back and trace the history, where does it come from? It, it only, and I think the uh, Garland. Uh, I know Carol Deval turned up Garland's letter, which claimed that that Pratt went through the camp with a French eagle. No, he didn't. He went through the camp with a, with a French banderole. Important difference. Um, just a bit, just a bit yeah. like handed from the hands of the emperor. So the next part of it is to talk about the, the Fanians. Yes. Uh, and um, they're interesting for a lot of reasons, and not least of which is Shari, who's the great expert on French uh, standards says that the these uh, fanions in the colours that I've uh, uh, talked about came about too late for them to be officially be in the uh, peninsula, and uh, so their their presence in the peninsula has, has not been reported um, until but, you look at it. Until you look at that. that Exactly. That's exactly what I was about to say. But we know that they must have been because, because why, otherwise, why is this guy in London drawing them in, in August 1812? Correct. Correct. So if we look at the, the white fanion, and the uh, thing about the fanions, which I think is very distinctive, is they have no writing on them. That was, alleged, that was the, uh, that was the uh, directive. And because they have no writing on them, as Shari says... You can't exclude the fact that the the regimental colonels would just make them up, just get a bit of uh, of white material, stick it on your spear, and that you've got a fanion. Uh, so they're easy to be made, and uh, so we then ask, well, where did the white fanion come from? And um, if we look at the regiments that lost more than fifty percent uh, at Salamanca, there were the sixty sixth, the twenty second, the sixty second and the 101st. Of these, the 62nd and the 101st Lynn lost more than 75% of their men. Of the second battalions involved, only the 2nd, 101st, was not in the order of battle in September. Because what happened to the French is they kept their level of violence, veteran troops high in their service battalions just by disbanding destroyed battalions and sending the men into the into the remaining battalions. This happened at Villa Muriel and everywhere. And so the chances are it's much more likely that that uh, second battalion, White Fanion, is from the 101st. 
and uh, so, sorry just to make sure that i've understood this rightly on the basis that and i'm reading what you've um written again folks can't emphasize enough to fully appreciate everything you're not only going to want to hear the rest of this but go look at it on the youtube channel to double check these these bits of information that are coming through um on the, the screen so because they lose so heavily at uh, because the 101st lose so heavily at Salamanca, effectively by September they've what been merged into a, a single battalion, and That's, yeah, they'll have been. They're, 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 I mean, I know better what happened to the uh, um, to the 66th from the Lemuriel, but and I'll come on to the 66th. The the battalion cadre gets sent back to the depot, and their remaining soldiers get distributed amongst the field battalions that are still there. So. Um, so when you look at the orders of battle for the French, uh, there are uh, some significant battalions missing in uh, in September and October when I was interested in Pavilion Muriel that were at Salamanca. And the 2nd, 101st is one of them. Uh, it could have been one of the other 2nd battalions, could have been, um, but uh, most of these battalions would give up their, their flags uh, only in duress. So my... My vote, if I was a betting man, I'd bet it was the 101st, but it could have been the 62nd. Um, uh, we don't know. And they also, as you say in this extract, um, they also lose their jingling Johnny, which quite often I see po people post as, oh, look, here's an eagle being taken. And it yeah. really gets my goat. I'm glad um, because it gets mine as well. <laughs> they're, 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 I tell you what really irritated me, actually. I was in the, um, the Sarko military interpretation center and they've got this label up saying french eagle and you know what it is it's a jingling johnny yeah it's not an eagle and you look at it and you sort of think but you're a it's not quite a museum but it's an interpretation center they're yeah. they're just way off the mark well i think these sorts of mistakes with google are unforgivable <laughs> You know, there are ways the people... Google would tell you that's not what it is. No, exactly. There are ways Just to take go a in. photograph of it and put it into Google. Exactly. <laughs> it's it's not that hard to do the research and and get the right interpretation. Okay, so let's, so let's the, progress the green, to the, flag. the green flag. Now, one of the things I did was I I I went through War Flags, which is a book of illustrations of the the. All of the standards that were in the um, uh, in the chapel, the guards' chapel, and all of this, and in there you find this picture of a plain green flag, and they label it East Indian flag, presumably because it's got a fluffy bit at the top. Uh, but the interesting thing is, it has it has no markings on it. Um, my contention is that's a fifth battalion fanion and probably the one captured by the 11th foot uh, at uh, Salamanca. So we have to look at, well, what are the 5th Battalions at uh, Salamanca? My, my next question, <laughs> because um, sadly the, the order of battle is, is not seared into my memory. No, um, well, the, there were three 5th Battalions at Salamanca. Two of them were in McCoon's division. And one was in the in Ferry's division, uh, the fifth twenty sixth. So the easy option here is to say, well, it's the fifth twenty sixth, isn't it? Because that was in Ferry's division. However, of these three battalions, uh, if you look at the losses, I'll give you a clue as to what happened next. The fifth sixty sixth disappeared from the order of battle, and. Uh, was um uh was replaced his card sent home and replaced by another battalion at Villa Muriel, whereas the fifth twenty six and the fifth eighty second survived. In fact, if you these are Fortigue's uh, figures, uh, the first of August uh, account suggests the fifth uh, twenty six hardly lost any men. So whether that's right or wrong is another matter. Uh, but my my the point I made in my chapter was you have to at least consider that the 5th 66th of McCoon's division is the one who lost their fanion to the 11th foot. 
And if I was going to rub it in a little bit, is that if you look at the standard deployment of the, the battalions in the divisions, uh, the 11th foot would have been on the opposite end of Ferry's line to the 26th linear. So I think it's a question that I'm prepared to pose without saying, yeah, this is a given. But I think the, the, the bigger question is we now know that these fanions were a thing in the peninsula, which is a, a novel uh, a novel finding itself. It's a nice thing to come out of this research, isn't it? Yeah. So, and I guess the, uh, you know, to finish the whole point, we go back to our friend McCune. Um, this is the conclusion of my chapter. Glory is fleeting, but it is more so when your commander-in-chief cast you as the full guy 33 years after your death. However, General Division Antoine Louis Popon Baron de McCune his bravery, nine wounds, 28 years' service to France. If not, his skill as a general will be remembered so long as the Arc de Triomphe stands. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, so really, firstly, I'm, I'm impressed by the, the class of the writing there. Uh, that's a nice way to, to wrap things up. Um, but there's my brain is hurting ever so slightly. It's been a <laughs> long time since I've recorded a podcast as a host and had to think this much that my brain has hurt at the end of it. But you've achieved that. Um, so congratulations, because um, it's rare that my brain has to work quite this hard during a you recording need to session. My chapter in I do. I genuinely do. I don't have a copy of Gloria's Fleeting, which oh, well. is an embarrassing admission um, for the guy who's supposed to be asking all of the pertinent questions um, on this show. Um, Gary, the other thing you. that's uh, interesting is the um, uh, in preparation for this, I uh, while uh, Professor Muir's book is the best book on Salamanca, this is my favourite one, which I read, Wellington's Masterpiece, which mm -hmm. I read 30 odd years ago. And so I thought I'd get it out and look at it. And it's the... It's the only account that seems to implicate, it seems to understand there was an issue about uh, um, Leith's division capturing an eagle from the 7th division rather than from McEwen's 5th division. And because they make a point, it was the light infantry must have been off to the flank somewhere. And uh, uh, but it's an important point that, uh, that I think goes to my argument that the rush of fugitives from Tommy Ayres and in the, in the face of the cavalry swept McCune's division aside and they got away uh, um, uh, to fight another hour um, while Leaf's division busied themselves rounding up prisoners from the 7th, including the Eagle. Uh, the, they took of the 62nd. It's it's only when you lay something out quite as clearly as you've done over the course of this that you do start to sit back and think more and more about the inconsistencies and go, why hasn't somebody noticed all of these problems before? But this is the point of research that is properly good. I know that's a really inelegant way of phrasing it, folks, but to do decent research involves you having to look at the accepted view sit down and go does that make sense and all too often and i am hugely guilty of this every historian who's ever picked up a pen is guilty of this you trust other historians particularly if they've got a reputation you trust other historians to have got it right and the danger is that through regurgitation of people who are respected scholars you end up with situations where things get missed and so the difference between a history and a good history of the period is those people who do what Gary's done in this particular case study. You sit down and you forensically pick this apart and go, somebody might have said it. That doesn't necessarily mean that I can trust it. Um, folks, Glory is Fleeting um, is an edited collection. I forget if it's Andrew who was the editor for that yeah. one. It's available at hellion.co.uk. Um, go and get it. Uh, unfortunately, I can't give you a discount code for Hellion, but it's a very reasonably priced volume anyway. So, you know, Christmas is coming up. Ask for Santa. 
to drop it into your stocking. Um, Gary, you will be back at some point. Um, okay. Probably not in the too distant. You're not getting a choice in it. It is happening. Um, <laughs> probably in the not too distant future either um, to discuss some of your other work. But on the basis that you will have applied that same level of care and attention to your research, I think folks are going to want to read your other publications. So Wellington's first battle, that's Boxtel in 1794. Who published that one? I did. K Shop Publishing. So okay. right, self published. I've got a few in the garage. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and presumably if people get in touch with you yeah, via Twitter. Or by Amazon. It's on Amazon. Okay. It's, oh, um, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, you've got all of that nailed down. If yeah. you're a devotee of what I consider to be the wrong war, which is basically every war that's not Napoleonic, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, but if you're interested in World War One, the men behind the memorial is... Who's that one with? Is that... When, Again, when it's when I did it, it, it what I it was a, a side project. The in the village I lived in at the time, there were twenty four guys on the memorial, and uh, well, started out as a series of village uh, parish magazine articles. I I researched each one of them, where they came from, how they died, and uh, and it, it, it uh, I put it together with a, a friend in the village um, uh, to raise money for the. Uh, for the church, basically. Um, oh, that's fantastic! Um, so it's there. It's it's a nice. Uh, it's not something I would normally do, but because, uh, uh, like you, my there is only one true war. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> uh, and talking of said one true war, um, Wellington at Bay, Villa Muriel, eighteen twelve. We're doing an interview on that. That that's it's just a given. We're we're going to sit down <laughs> and discuss that. Uh, we're probably going to do an interview on Boxtel as well because why not? Um, and last. Most recently, but by no means least, throwing thunderbolts, which is um, your wargamers guide, isn't it? You know, you, yeah. you were saying earlier, or in the first episode, if you're listening to this on the podcast, that you know you come at this through wargaming. Got to say, this is a safe space in which you can confess to that. Nobody's going to judge you. <laughs> we're all we're all devotees of painting plastic figures. We've all got that bug. Um, well, I think the I think there's a serious. I mean, one of the things that the about uh, I mean there are all types of war gamers I'm at the nerdy end um, and I think the advantage of war gaming is that you actually have to put physically things on the table you have to consider time and motion because that's how the games work and uh, so things that you if you just read the history book you might skip past as soon as you're trying to lay it out as a scenario for a game you're saying, well, hang on a minute, what's this five-hour gap doing, um, for example? And you are painting flags, so knowing what they are is a, is important, and albeit nerdy in my case. Hey, um, you're talking to somebody who styles themselves as the Napoleon nerd, um, <laughs> albeit not as baby face as I used to. <laughs> uh, so um sadly age is catching up with me people um but throwing thunderbolts is on the war of the first coalition 1792 to 7 i know we have chatted about the possibility of a, a mini series uh, on the show about that because i'm going to be quite frank and honest and say my war of the first coalition knowledge is nowhere near as good as it needs to be um and we haven't covered it in any sense on this show until now so we will um leave that sort of tantalizing threat well there are uh, only 280 battles to to, to consider <laughs> that's 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 minor we, we can do it in like 20 minutes surely <laughs> um, so there you go folks plenty more to look forward to but christmas is coming up you've heard the quality of gary's forensic approach to this you're going to want to go and buy some of his work gary an absolute joy to talk to you thank you so much for opening my and the listeners eyes to this I've got lots of thinking to go away and do, um, and I need to reach for the maps of Salamanca Battlefield, quite frankly, and, and start reconsidering all of this. Thank you for joining us, um, and I look forward to having you back here very soon. Right. Thanks for the opportunity, Zach. Really enjoyed it. Folks, if you're new here, remember to hit the subscribe button so that you can find your way back. Much love to all my Patreon supporters, and shout-outs to my mentioned in Dispatches patrons, Rob Griffith, Brendan Teeling, Beatrice de Graaf, Lynn Dawson, Lucy Tatner, Jim Deary, Josh Keeney, Colin Fieldhouse, Stephen Coulson, Jim Getz, Indiana Fats, Stephen Gillen, Rob Coughlin, Hugh Brennan, Alistair Campbell-Greve, Andy Meakin, Mark Anscombe, Bruins Girl, Noah Fink, 
Mark Trowbridge, Mars Reedy, Nick Overland, Graham Goodwin, Chris Pramus, Anthony Gumbau, Andrew Wright, Anonymous American, Martin Pisani, Auric Ducado, James Fluick, Roger O'Donnell, Natasha Hobday, Chris Kimball, Gary Dennis, David Graylick, Ted Andrews, David Malinsky, Richard Anderson, Arthur Forgey, Reto the Sci-Fi Fan, Adam Green, Tim Day, Sam Moore, Wyatt Pollock, Armin Darwin, Carol Dixon-Smith, Paul Gasek, and Roland Shark. And the Admirals, John Haynes, JC Kaiser, Mike Guest, Liam Telfer, Todd and Laird Campbell, Graham Swidenbank, Rachel Stark, Mark Duckers, David Maxwell, David Priest, Graham Callister, Sean Sullivan, Stephen Ashworth, Dan Hazelwood, Kate Walcombe, Steve Carter, and Clemens. I'll be back very soon, but until then, I'm Zach White. This has been the Napoleonic Wars Pod. Take care of yourselves, my friends. Stay well, stay safe, and as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>